So now we're going to talk about the purposes of research, and also we'll, we'll cover some key concepts for the class, specifically key concepts in social sciences research that we're only going to briefly introduce in this video, but you'll learn much more detail, in-depth detail uh, throughout the semester. So there are three, essentially, there are three purposes of research. One is for explore, exploration or exploratory research. Two is essentially just want to describe a relationship or describe not even a relationship, just describe the people or the scenario in which people use something. And three, explain. And explain is essentially the relationship between one item and another or one uh, concept and another. So exploratory research essentially is like a pilot study, you know, where you, you, you gather up like a dozen people and you ask them, okay, you, you, let's say you sample, say, 20, 12 people, 12 women who are reproductive, reproductive age, and you want to find out what their self-perceived barriers are to uh, contraceptive, contraceptives in their community, okay? So, and you do this to sort of spur on larger studies, or even a study in itself, because a pilot study is really small, usually, and it's only to generate ideas because you have really no idea what, for example, you would have no idea what the barriers are in a certain community. So you just decide to ask them these questions. Or you do the pilot study just to see if, uh, say, women of reproductive age would even be interested in using a novel sort of reproductive source. And uh, exploratory studies are really just the first step in a larger study that was done down the road. The purpose of a descriptive study is really just answering the questions of what, when, where, and how. For example, you decide to do a study of uh, people who are accessing, uh, say, the reproductive health clinics in the neighborhood. Okay, So the question is what? So what types of reproductive health clinics are being accessed in their neighborhood? And when are they being accessed? Are they being accessed during the weekends, during the day, during the night? Are they doing it while the husbands are at work? Um, and, and where are they doing it? Are they doing it in your neighborhood? Are they doing it in the neighborhood next door? Why are they doing it next door in the neighborhood is actually a separate question. Okay? But the other question would be how? Are they accessing it by, are they driving? Are they taking a, a car? Are they taking the bus? So the, all you're doing is really getting a snapshot of the individuals accessing a certain, let's say, business or, or clinic or something along those lines. So all you really know from a descriptive study is who is accessing what, okay? So if you go to the uh, Starbucks, if you go to Starbucks on campus and you, access, and you interview, say, 15 people on, uh, at Starbucks and you just ask them, okay, what grade are you in? and what, how old are you, and how often do you come to Starbucks? So those are basically descriptive ideas, right? You're not asking them anything other than who they are. It's really a snapshot of who they are. Generally, all studies published will have a, a portion of their study that is descriptive. And in that descriptive study, will have the sort of the age breakdown, their gender, maybe their race, their ethnicity, and perhaps even ideas about uh, their, um, say, education level or their economic status. An explanatory study, however, is something that really looks to answer a specific question. Okay? It's not asking who they are. It's actually asking why they're accessing. Why are you going to Starbucks in the middle of the day? Or why are you actually going to the uh, re reproductive health clinic in the next neighborhood over instead of your own? And why are you taking the car, uh, taking the bus instead of driving your own car? Or why, are, uh, why, 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 basically, right? So it's always trying to find a relationship between some concept and an outcome, okay? So why do people who, uh, why are these people getting lung cancer? And, do we, and we find out because they smoke, right? So um, that's, that's answering the question why. The scientific method and, and essentially the key concepts in the social sciences research uh, 
really revolves around the idea of forming a hypothesis, okay? And a hypothesis is really just and more or less restating the question you're trying to answer. So if the question is, do students who work have lower GPA than students who do not work? That's a, that's a research question. A hypothesis, however, would be stated as students who work have, an, have a lower GPA. It's a very, it's a statement. There's no question. It's a hypothesis. Your hypothesis is that students who work have a lower GPA. And the next question you should always ask yourself is, is it, is it testable? And, and for this example, it absolutely is testable. Um, you, there might be a case where you just can't test it. And, and um, throughout your project for, your, for this class, uh, before you even come up, be, while you're coming up with research questions, before you actually implement your design, I'll help you decide whether it's testable. Um, and sometimes you're not going to fully understand it until you actually think through the problem. Most of the time your question will be testable. But I will say that the research question and the hypothesis are actually some of the harder things to come up with. Because what you think might be a good interesting research question um, actually ends up being either more difficult to test or much more complicated to implement. Um, and, and this goes all the way up the level of expertise. Even the highest level of expertise in, in terms of professors and so on sometimes have a difficult time coming up with a really proper research question. The next step is really to test the hypothesis. And in order to test it, you do a survey, or you perform a study, or you experiment. And then, lastly, you analyze your data. And you analyze your data, and really, the analysis is really just to confirm or reject the hypothesis. So you're going to use statistics to basically analyze your data and come up with the report of your results. So constructing your hypothesis is there a relationship between how many cups of coffee I drink at night and how bad my headache is in the morning? So some people get headaches when they drink their coffee. I am one of them. Although it doesn't stop me from drinking my coffee, I still drink it. So you want to notice that in the hypothesis that I constructed here, I have both variables in my hypothesis. Okay, I have both the exposure variable, which is drinking coffee, and I have my headaches, which is my outcome, right? So is this a question, is this a hypothesis that is testable? And it absolutely is testable, right? So in order to do this, I've decided to keep a journal for a month. And I've collected data on my coffee drinking and headaches. So I've entered my data into this table. It's a contingency table, or sometimes it's called a cross-tabulation. Sometimes it's called a 2 by 2 table, although this is actually technically a 3 by 2 table. But nevertheless, in the end, we're actually going to refer to this table in this class, and you're going to see this a lot. We're going to refer to it as a contingency table or a cross-tab or a cross-tabulations table. Okay? So notice in here I have the numbers of number of coffee cups I've had every day. So 0 to 1, 2 to 4, or 5 or more. And then by the row, the rows, I have my degree of headache, which is my not so severe or not severe, and I can't even get out of bed. And there's something called a marginal total, and we'll learn about this later as the semester goes on. But a marginal total is essentially just adding up the rows and adding up the columns. And those totals for each one of those columns and each one of those rows create the marginal total, right? So if you go down the column of 0 to 1 cups, I have 15 total people. Or in this case, it's cups, actually. It's 15 total cups. And then for the second column of 2 to 4 cups, I have a total of 6 cups, right? And for 5 or more cups, I have 9 cups, or 9 days, or whatever. Okay? So I collected this data. I collected these data over 30 days. Out of those 30 days, and, and by the way, my 30 days is reflected down here in the lower right. That's my total number of days. So your bottom right in a contingency table, the bottom right cell will always reflect the sum total of whatever unit you're using to analyze. In this case, it's, it's days, right? So I have 22 days, 22 days here, of which I had not so severe headache, right? So I have a not, not severe headache, I go across, I have 22 days. And here, I can't get out of bed, which is a really severe headache, I only have 8 total days. So I have 22 days here for not severe, and 8 days here where I can't get out of bed. 
Of those 22 days, 15 days were in my 0 to 1, game, zero to one cups. And 4 days were 2 to 4, and 3 or 5 or more. And of those 8 total days where I couldn't even get out of bed, 2 of them were 2 out of 4 day, two to four cups, and f 6 of them were 5 or more cups. Notice I didn't have any days where I couldn't get out of bed where I had 0 or 1 cup of coffee. So I have two types of variables. I have the number of cups of coffee, and I've made those into categories of 0 and 1. I also have a second category of 2 to 4 cups, and I have 5 or more. I also have my outcome variable, which is my degree of headache. And I have it in categories of not severe, and I can't get out of bed. I can relabel these any way I want. I'm just, this is the categories I've decided to choose. So can you think of any other variables that could actually be helpful in testing our hypothesis? So in other words, I'm looking at the impact of coffee and headaches. Could there be any other factor that has uh, an impact on my headache? Uh, I, my guess is you could have maybe the stress level or maybe a predisposition for headaches. There's a number of things. Maybe if you're a smoker or dehydrated, it's all sorts of things that can come into play for headaches. Let's look at causes. We have something called, this is sort of the philosophy area of the class, okay? You have something called a necessary and you have something called a sufficient cause. So you have necessary and sufficient causes. A necessary cause is really just a cause, a condition that must be present for the effect to follow, okay? Whereas a sufficient cause is the condition that, if present, guarantees the effect in question. And causes that are both necessary and sufficient are, are really the most satisfying outcomes in research. Now, that's not going to be seen in your research for this particular class, in your design, because survey designs are difficult to come up with these types of causes. But necessary causes and sufficient causes are key to understanding research in general, and uh, we'll go into more detail here. A necessary condition is some factor must be present in order for the outcome to occur. Okay? So, for example, being female is a necessary condition in order to be pregnant. Correct? Because you can't be male and become pregnant. So the necessary condition here is female. And that is the sum factor must be present in order for the outcome to occur. Well, in order for the outcome, which is pregnancy, to occur, you must be female. Okay? So that is a necessary condition. A sufficient condition is the sum factor in which the outcome will definitely or definitely not take place. For example, if you did not take the exam, you are going to fail a test. You, you can't pass the exam without taking, without taking the test. So that is the sufficient condition. If you took the exam, you could still fail, but you could also still pass the exam. But if you don't take the exam, you will not pass the, the exam. If you don't take it, you won't pass. Okay, so that is the sufficient condition. Some factor in which the outcome will definitely take place. The outcome will definitely take place if you did not take the exam. The uh, failing the exam will definitely take place if you did not take the exam. So now we're going to shift from your hypothesis, which is, say, again, let's, let's use the example of working students in GPA. We're going to shift from that hypothesis to theory, okay? Um, if you were really interested in the idea that it's not just the impact that working students, that, that working students have on their GPA, it's actually the impact it has on their personal life and it has on on their family life and, and all sorts of other factors. Then we're expanding the hypothesis into a grander sort of theory. It's multiple hypotheses, if you will. Let's use the coffee and the headaches, for example. 
you decide to, quote, nerd out, and you want to find out if there are any other reasons you end up with severe headaches, sometimes after several cups of coffee. So you expand upon your present hypothesis to explain the severe headaches phenomenon. So you could do a study where smoking cigars during the week can actually result in bad headache. So by contrast, drinking beers during the week can result in more severe bad headaches. So other hypotheses in the theory are introduced and you give this sort of bigger picture of the risk of bad headaches. Um, for this class, you're only going to be working with one hypothesis. So you're not going to be expanding any hypothesis here. You're not going to be, quote, nerding out and trying to develop a theory. You're just going to be concentrating on one research question. And for this example, it would be, you know, drinking coffee has an impact on headaches, something along those lines. So we have to talk about the types of relationships we also might have in this in social sciences, or any sciences for that matter. So in order for a, a, a positive or an inverse relationship to really make sense, both variables really need to be quantifiable. In other words, numerical. Uh, age is numerical, cholesterol, IQ, Something that you can count, okay, that's numer numerical is a number, right? So if it's quantifiable. So if you can count someone's, if you can put a number to someone's shoe size, or give a number to someone's GPA, or you can give a number to the number of cups of coffee they've had, then you can look at a positive and an inverse relationship, okay? So a positive relationship is a relationship that is greater associated with greater and less is associated with less. So for example, the bigger shoe size you have, the greater math skill you have, right? And I know it seems absurd, but this is likely the case for most people. In fact, it's likely the case for nearly all people. In other words, and, and the older we get, the more math skills we, we obtain, right? So the older we get, the bigger shoes we have, the bigger feet we have. So there is a positive correlation, or a direct correlation sometimes it's referred to. I'm going to call it a positive for this course. A positive correlation between shoe size and math skill. You could also say the same correlation exists for a shoe size and age, right? The bigger shoe size you have, the greater age you have. So the greater is associated with greater, okay? The other type of relationship we might see is a negative relationship, or sometimes referred to as an inverse relationship. For this course, I'll refer to it as an inverse more often, but just so you know, inverse and negative are often used interchangeably, although inverse relationship is the more uh, appropriate term. This is where the greater is associated with actually the lesser, and the lesser is associated with the greater. Here's an example. Here's a graph of the likelihood your boyfriend or husband will cheat on you versus the number of video games he owns, okay? So, you'll see here that the, the percentage change in him cheating is decreased versus the number of games he owns. So, for example, if he has nine video games in his possession, the chance of him cheating on you is nearly zero, or it is zero. Probably because he doesn't have any time to cheat on you. Whereas if he has no video games, that means he might be a, uh, have a little more free time and have the op uh, maybe the, perhaps the, prop the probability for him cheating is a lot higher. Now clearly this is all in jest, but the point of this matter is that as one goes down, the other one goes up. So as the likelihood that he cheats on you goes down, as it goes down, this goes up, right? So here it's 9 and here it's 0, whereas here it's 0 and this is 100%, right? So this is considered an inverse relationship. So let's talk about the variables. When I talked about the hypothesis, I talked about both the types of outcomes and also the predictor. So in other words, we talked about, say, uh, headaches and coffee, right? So the number of cups of coffee I've had and the severity of my headache. 
Those are two variables. So I have a dependent variable, which is my outcome variable. It is the variable that is actually being caused or explained. It's called the dependent variable because changes in this variable actually depend on the changes in the exposure or the independent variable. And it's also referred to quite often as the outcome variable or even in, in statistics it's often referred to as the Y, okay, the letter Y. So for our example of uh, coffee drinking and headaches, the dependent variable would be headache. The independent variable here uh, in that case would be coffee drinking. So the independent variable is really doing the causing, right? So it's often caused the exposure, it's often called the exposure variable or, or even the predictive variable because it predicts the outcome. Lastly, let's talk about the unit of analysis. What we were actually studying and measuring and, and testing our hypothesis essentially. So in this study here, where I looked at my number of coffee drink, cups of coffee and the severity of my headache, I actually looked at it the total number of days. Right, so my unit of analysis is actually here, days. So the unit of analysis of my hypothesis is day, right? The conclusions about our study do not necessarily transcend all unit analysis, units of analysis. For example, I might actually randomly sample 30 students on campus, and I got these data, numbers of cups of coffee that particular day, and the severity of their headache that day, right? So instead of total days here, this would be removed. I would remove this day and I would put total students because it would be 30 students I sampled. And so this 22 would not represent 22 days that I looked at myself over 30 days. It would represent 22 out of the 30 people I interviewed. This will make more sense as the semester goes on and we actually are start starting to collect our data and applying these concepts with our research. Um, the unit of analysis for your studies and your projects will almost assuredly all be people. 